Well, thank you to my vast audience here today. Very happy to be here. I will say I like the introduction of this being a secret session. Um, I used to work at Oak Ridge National Lab, which was in a place called the Secret City, because during the wartime when it was first created, it was a very secret place. So I'm very used to these sort of clandestine sort of things. Um, so my name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I'm a staff member at IVEC, which is a supercomputing center here in Perth, Western Australia. And I'm here with my treasured colleague, Rebecca Tung. So if you have a question, you just ask Rebecca. 100% chance you'll ask the right person. Um, and so Rebecca was, uh, she was a student at Curtin University. She just graduated with honors, first class. Um, from Curtin University and she was also a member of the team. So we're here today to tell you about uh, what we did uh, for, for the past school year. So the title of our talk is 16,000 kilometers, 128 cores, 11 students, one team, the Australian entrance into the international scene of competitive Linux system administration. So that's a little bit of an overblown but sort of a fun title. Um, so what we're going to talk about is this competition that we participated in. Here's our outline. We're going to talk first about the student cluster competition and what it is and why people want to participate in it. We're going to talk about how we built and trained the team for the student cluster competition. Um, we're going to talk about our cluster design. And then um, we're going to talk about the science applications that we ran on it and about the competition itself and how it went. So first of all, we're going to talk about the student cluster competition. This is a picture of all of the students who trained with us um, through the year. Unfortunately, only six of them were able to go to the United States to participate in the competition because it's a six-person team. But here's what the competition is. So it's a 48-hour non-stop computing showdown, and it's held at the annual supercomputing conference. This year it was held in Denver, Colorado. Um, and basically what happens is you have teams of undergraduates who design and build a cluster and then they run actual scientific applications on this cluster. Now there are two tracks this year. Um, one of them was the, the um, standard track and for the standard track you had a constraint on your power budget so you could have only about 3,000 watts of power going to your cluster. Um, the other track was called the commodity track and for that you could only spend $2,500 on your machine. On, one rack. on uh, your whole machine. So here's some key rules that we had to follow. Uh, so first of all, your machine has to contain only publicly available components. So you can't have some top secret latest, greatest new thing uh, from NVIDIA or something like that. It has to be something that people could go out and buy on the shelf. Um, the second thing is that all of the components have to be turned on at all times. If they're in a low watt idle state, that's all right, but they have to be on. And then the third thing is, when you're running your applications, you can't exceed 26 amps at 120 volts power draw. So that amounts to roughly 3,120 watts. So that, those were the three rules that we had to obey in order to uh, do this competition. So what you do with the applications is you run some applications that are actual science applications. So the first thing is HPCC, that is the high performance computing, I can't remember what it stands for now. But anyway, it is, it is a benchmark and it's used to uh, determine uh, how powerful your supercomputer is. So it, it does, um, it, it, it does LINPAC, which is a measure of your flops floating point operations, it also measures your bandwidth, your latency, a, w a wide variety of different things. And then there are three applications that we knew of that were going to be at the competition, so we studied for those. So those were Graph Lab, Wharf, and Nemo 5, and we'll talk more about those in a few minutes. And then there was a mystery application that we didn't know that was going to be given at the time of the competition. And it turned out to be an application called Flying Snakes, which was built on top of Open Foam, which is a computational fluid dynamics package. So the teams are judged on the throughput of their work, so how much work they get done. And then also, uh, they are interviewed by the judges to determine the depth of their understanding, both about the applications and about the machine itself. Now, the student cluster competition was first held at SCO7, in 2007. Um, and it was the brainchild of Brent Gorda, and this is a picture of him with our team mascot, Happy Cheeks, the Quokka. And Brent Gorda 
um, was a really ahead of his time to think of this, it was a really important way to get undergraduate students engaged in high performance computing. A lot of times students don't even know that supercomputers exist until, uh, until they go to graduate school, and even by then it may be too late. Now, today there are actually three competitions per year. So one of them is in China, and it's held in April. And then there's one at ISC, which is the International Supercomputing Conference, which is held in Europe, and that's in June. And then the ones at SC, which are in November. And those are the most prestigious ones. So that's why we wanted to go to that one. Now, you may be wondering, why do we have this strange power constraint? Well, as supercomputers grow in size, power is increasingly the number one constraint on what you can build. So take, for example, Jaguar, which was, which was the machine at Oak Ridge National Laboratory where I worked. So in 2009, it was number one on the top 500 list. So it was the most powerful supercomputer in the world. It was capable of 1.759 petaflops. It had 18,688 nodes, 200 cabinets, okay? When that machine was running full blast, it drew eight megawatts of power. But even when it was just idling, just sitting there turned on but not doing anything, it's drawing four megawatts of power. Now in Tennessee, where this computer is, they have very cheap electricity. So the annual cost is about a million dollars per megawatt year. So you can figure on at least a $5 million a year power bill just for this machine, not to mention all of the cooling costs that are associated with a machine like this. So we're talking a lot of a lot of money and a lot of power. I mean, you had to, so Oak Ridge National Lab, where Jaguar was, had its own power substation that they built just for this machine. Now, in about 2020, we expect to have an exascale machine, so that would be a machine that would be capable of an exaflop. And I should say, it, a petaflop is 10 to the 15th floating point operations per second. An exaflop is 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. Um, the power budget, however, is 20 megawatts. So we have to raise our performance by a thousand times by only raising the power at most three times. How in the world are we going to accomplish this? So if you look at this graph, this is a graph of the top 500 list and the power that they draw. So on the x-axis is the um, number of flops. And on the y-axis is the kilowatts of power. And you can see this rainbow. So the, the red ones are from 2007, the yellow is 2008, green 2009, etc. until you come out here. And you see this black dot way up there? That is the exascale machine. Okay, so we're nowhere near being able to do this. So this is why this power constraint is really important. It really started to come into focus in about 2007 when Brent started this competition. So now, why would IVEC want to do this, right? We're a supercomputing center here in Perth. Um, well, one of our big missions is to increase computational science literacy in Western Australia. We have a lot of great people in Western Australia, but they don't really have the knowledge about computational science, so we want to improve that. Um, we want to develop future users and employees is another thing. So a lot of students who are undergraduates here go on to get their PhD also here in Western Australia. So this is a way for us to train up our future users who might be graduate students using our machines and possibly faculty members later on. Um, we want to also train the professional workforce for the local industry. So a lot of mining companies really do a lot of computing. And so if we can train up students who have the type of knowledge that they need for that, then that'd be very helpful. Um, another thing is we want, IVEC is kind of, we're trying to become a big supercomputing name in the, in the world of supercomputing. So this is a way to kind of increase our exposure on the global scene. And then finally, it just sounded like a lot of fun. So that's why we decided to do it. All right, so moving along, um, building and training the team. So uh, we know everybody likes XKCD, right? So we've got a little, little cartoon here. So the, uh, the number one programmer's excuse for legitimately slacking off is my code is compiling. And hey, get back to work. Compiling, oh, okay, carry on. So this is exactly how we trained, actually. We also did some sword play. No, I'm kidding. Um, so 
nobody here had ever actually heard of the student cluster competition. Fair enough. So I had to start by raising interest at our partner university. So IVIC consists of, uh, it's kind of an unincorporated joint venture between CSIRO and the four public universities here in Western Australia. So that's the nice thing is we've got four universities to work with here. So I contacted the directors of IVIC at the various universities and asked them for contacts of professors who I could talk to. Um, the first interest actually came from Edith Cowan University, which is a small uh, user of IVEC resources, so I was actually kind of surprised. But they came up with three students. And then after that, it was pretty easy to get interest from the other universities because nobody wants to be shown up by their rivals in town. So the other universities followed, and by the end, we actually had 11 students who were interested. Next, we had to get sponsorship. So we got some sponsors. Uh, we got these four main sponsors, and it's SGI, NVIDIA, Alinea, and Rio Tinto, and I'll talk a little more about them in a second here. So the most important thing was to have a sponsor for our hardware of our machine. And so uh, I talked with Cray and SGI. They're both big supercomputing companies that have supercomputers in our center. Um, and SGI was actually the first one to come through and say, yeah, we're really interested. So they committed some hardware. They said they would sponsor our hardware, our cluster, and they would give us some travel money, which was really great. Um, then we solicited financial sponsorship from some mining companies in WA, and we were able to get Rio Tinto to commit to give us some money. And they agreed to sponsor the costs for three students. And then we also got software and hardware sponsorship from Alinea and NVIDIA, and I'll tell you a little more about that in a few minutes. Um, so the hardware sponsorship was really the most important sponsorship that we needed to get. SGI was super enthusiastic about sponsoring our team. They were fantastic people. I recommend them wholeheartedly. Um, they actually they committed their best person in the Asia Pacific region, is what they told me, uh, to, to help us. And his name was Todd. He was a fantastic guy. And Todd helped us to select our machine hardware, um, determine the software stack, and he set it. He helped set it up in Perth, and then at the competition when we got to the competition. So when we decided to use GPUs in our cluster, we got a loan of eight K20X GPUs from NVIDIA to put in. Um, we received them through the academic program, so we got them for free. But then we had to return them at the end, unfortunately. Now, travel is very expensive, so this competition was held in Denver, Colorado in the United States, and so it, that's about as far as you can possibly go from Perth. Um, so we budgeted $3,000 per student for travel, and that was right on. That was a very close budget. Um, SGI committed enough for half of the team, and then Rio Tinto supported the other half of our team. So that was fantastic. Now, Software sponsorship. I hadn't really planned on getting any software sponsors for the team, but it just so happened that I won a license from Alinea for one of their products. They did tell me that there were other competitors, but I wasn't quite sure if you have to tell people that. Maybe there weren't any other competition. So, um, but I didn't quite know what I was going to do with this software license. So instead, what I did was I, I proposed to them, well, why don't you sponsor a license for my team instead? And so they provided a license for their MAP and DDT products. And MAP is a simple profiling tool, and it's really, really useful. It came in handy for our team. And then DDT is a, is a debugger for parallel programs, and it's also very easy to use and intuitive. So I think that was a great, great sponsorship, as it turned out. Now, my team ended up being three computer science slash games majors from ECU. Uh, two physics and computer engineering majors from UWA, and one geophysicist from Curtin who is standing right over here. Um, I assigned each student an area of expertise, so they all had one primary area of expertise and they had two secondary. Um, at the beginning of the training, I also facilitated a them to develop some team norms, kind of team rules, how we're going to behave, you know, what does it mean if we're meeting at three o'clock, does that mean we get there right at 3 o'clock and we all work? Does it mean we get there at 3 o'clock, we goof off for five minutes before we get started? You know, just various things like that. And because they had a, a big stake in it, because they had formulated these rules, we had absolutely no problems with anybody behaving incorrectly or anything like that. 
Okay, so onward to the third part of our talk. I'm going to talk about cluster design. So uh, this is another XKCD uh, called Crazy Straws, and they say, um, the thing to understand about the plastic crazy straw design world is that there are two main camps, the professionals designing for established brands and the hobbyists. The hobbyist mailing lists are full of drama with friction between the regulars and a splinter group focused on loops. And it says, um, human subcultures are nested fractally. There's no bottom. So anyway, so normally when you design a supercomputer cluster, there are a lot of factors that go into it. Um, the biggest factor is usually cost. You're concerned about the cost. Um, space, like how, how big is the machine? How much space do you have to put it? Um, utility, you know, how, how well you can use it. It's performance, the number of flops. Um, how much power it uses, and of course cost. Put that twice on purpose. Um, however, when we were designing ours, since SGI was footing the tab, um, we didn't have to worry about cost. We also really didn't have to worry about space. Um, so really the only things we were concerned about was how well we could use it, um, how well it would perform, and then how much power that was our biggest constraint because of the rules of the competition. So we had a couple of different choices of architectures. Uh, we could have gone with uh, nodes that were all CPU nodes, um, or we could have gone with all accelerator nodes, or we could have gone with a hybrid of a CPU and accelerator node. But then our question was, well, if we're going to go with accelerators, what should we do? Should we go with NVIDIA Teslas? Should we go with Intel Xeon Phi's or a combination? That would be kind of crazy. But what we ended up doing was we, we had our cluster here, and it, had, it was a hybrid architecture with NVIDIA GPUs. So we had um, two what they call pyramid nodes. That's SGI's term for these nodes. Um, and they had four NVIDIA K20Xs in them each. And then they each had two Intel Ivy Bridge 12 cores with 64 gig of memory. Um, and then we had eight Hollister nodes. And Hollister is just also, again, their term for these types of nodes. Um, and those nodes each had two Ivy Bridge 12 core 64 gig processors in them. Um, they had an InfiniBand interconnect. And if you took it and you just added up all of the power that those NVIDIA um, GPUs are going to draw plus all of the power that the uh, CPUs are going to draw. It was way above the power budget. But what our plan was, was to only run GPUs or only run CPUs at once. We would not run both of them together. So this worked out pretty well. Um, the reason we chose a hybrid architecture was that one of the big things that we get graded on in this is the, our LINPAC performance. So the performance on our benchmark for how many flops that our machine can make. Well, so if we didn't have GPUs, we were just going to get completely destroyed in that part of the competition. So we didn't want to get embarrassed. So that's why we chose to put some GPUs in them. Um, another thing is this mystery application. We didn't know anything about it. I was personally betting that it would be something that would be GPU friendly that could be run on GPUs. It turned out not to be, but we didn't know at the time. Um, and then also, you know, you can get a lot more flops per watt, and that goes back to the LINPAC numbers. You can get a lot more flops per watt by using a GPU rather than a CPU. So we also had to put some software on our cluster. And so here's kind of a rundown of what we put on it. So CentOS is the first thing. We put CentOS on it. Um, for Linux. Um, we used the Ceph file system, and then we used a lot of open source software. So we'll talk more in detail about those. And then, of course, we also did have some proprietary software. So why did we choose CentOS? Well, it's because we had two choices. So SGI will ship you with either SUSE or CentOS. So we just chose CentOS because it's pure open source. Um, and then Ceph. So this was an interesting choice. It was actually kind of suggested by Todd, our guy from SGI. I had never heard of Ceph. I'm an applications person. I'm not a, I'm not a file system or a machine person at all. Um, so each of our nodes was going to have a disk of at least one terabyte. 
And so we wanted to put them together as a parallel file system. I think traditionally people use Lustre. Um, however, there's, there can be a lot of issues with Lustre, especially if one of your nodes goes down. And we anticipated that it was entirely possible that our nodes would be going up and down at all times. So, so Todd proposed Ceph. And Ceph is a distributed object store and file system that's designed for uh, performance, reliability, and scalability. So Ceph is actually an object storage system, but it has a file system look like inter POSIX interface. Um, and so it looks just like a regular file system. So from a user perspective, you can't tell any difference. Um, and it's, it can be directly mounted as long as you have a recent, recently updated CentOS kernel. I don't remember the exact um, numbers. But underneath, what Ceph does is he keep, it keeps um, several copies of the files balanced across the hosts. And generally, you go with three copies. You can go with two, you can go with 10, you can go with as many as you want. Um, it has a metadata server, and it can expand or contract to fit the size of your file system. And then when one of your nodes goes down, the metadata server recognizes this, and then it starts rebalancing everything. Um, so it'll rebalance it dynamically, and it'll distribute the data. Um, in our case, our two pyramid nodes had smaller disks on them than the rest of the nodes. So, so it was kind of a weighted balance. Those were smaller disks, so they didn't get as much of the data. But Ceph was really good, and it really looked just like a regular file system. And I think we'll probably go with that again this next year. Um, so another thing is our open source software. So we did have the GCC compiler suite on there. GCC is really great for uh, C++ codes. It doesn't always give you maybe the optimal performance, but, it, but we definitely needed it on there in order to compile some of the codes that we were using. Um, we also had OpenMPI on there, so that's our message passing interface library uh, for parallel computing. And OpenMPI is what we use at IVEC on most of our machines already, so we just chose that because the students were already very familiar with that. Um, and then we also installed some mathematical libraries that were going to be useful for these applications and possibly for the mystery application. We weren't sure what it was going to be. Um, so FFTW is the fastest Fourier transform in the West. It's often used in, in um, applications. Um, Petsy is some solvers for nonlinear systems of equations. That's another one that you find a lot. And then uh, we had some data I.O. formatting libraries like NetCDF and HDF5. Then we also had some proprietary software on here. Um, so we had the Intel compiler and the MKL. And the reason we had those is because um, the Intel compiler, you know, it's made by Intel for their Intel processors. And so it will give you the best performance um, in a lot of cases. Um, and then the MKL numerical library is also tuned for these Ivy Bridge processors, so it just made sense to use that whenever we could, too. Okay, we also had Alinea DDT and MAP, and so, as I said, Alinea was one of our sponsors, uh, and so they gave us this license that we used on our machine also, um, just in case we needed it. I don't think we ended up using it at all, did we? Not, not during the competition, but we weren't sure what we were going to need. Um, we also had the PGI compiler. The PGI compiler provides OpenACC accelerator support. So this is a, a way of using directives instead of writing CUDA code in order to uh, use an accelerator. And we didn't know if maybe the uh, mystery application was going to be accelerated with OpenACC, so we had that on our machine as well. And finally, we also had CUDA on there. Now, I think it's sort of open source and sort of not, but uh, we had CUDA on there, and that was necessary for our accelerated high-performance LINPACK that we ran. So switching gears now, we're going to talk about applications, and I'm going to let Becca take over here for me. All right, so um, as you can see, I'm the only one from the team here today because five of my other teammates couldn't make it because some of them's working and you know people holidaying down south. So I'm actually in charge of the mystery application. So I was supposed to make sure that I could compile it and run everything that um, that it, um, the competition gave us. So I'm not really experts on all areas. So I'm just going to give you all my knowledge today of the other areas and bear with me. So um, there were three applications 
namely Graph Lab, Nemo 5, and Worf. There was another mystery application, as Rebecca mentioned before, um, that we had to compile and run, which was only made known to us when we actually started the competition, hence mystery. So first, I'm going to go through high performance LINPAC. I'll come back to this image in a while. Let me just explain it. So LINPAC is a software library for solving linear algebra, and which actually makes use of the BLAS libraries, which stands for Basic Linear Algebra Libraries. It was written in Fortran and have been largely superseded by LAPAC, which runs more efficiently on modern architectures now. Uh, Parallel LINPAC is the benchmark in the implementation that is called HPL and is used to benchmark and rank supercomputers for the top 500 list. So going back to this image, HPL can be defined as the software package that solves a random dense linear system of order n equals to z x x b, or in this case a. Um, it uses 64-bit floating point arithmetic on distributed memory computers. So the data is distributed into a two dimension p by q grid of processes of size nb by nb, as you can see on the your left, and where n is the problem size, p is the process of matrix rows, and q is the process matrix columns, if that makes sense. So it uses open source libraries, MPI, and BLAS, and it's used for stress testing and maintenance. Yep, so um, the standard for HPL as I said before, it was written in C++ and in Fortran and has become the standard benchmark used um, to measure supercomputing performance. But, and then LINPAC was then accelerated with CUDA, which was developed by NVIDIA. It uses GPU memory instead of the CPU, which is actually more popular and now being used in the student class competition now because the GPUs just provide better flow support. So these are the um, scores of the LINPAC. As you can see that, you know, from 2007 all the way from 2013, we've come a really, really long way. And I think China was the one who won the LINPAC this, or last year, with um, a LINPAC score of 8.2 something, which was a great achievement. So something to, to note, um, LINPAC doesn't push memory hard uh, disk drives or networks, just calculation of how fast your computer communicates. Um, this may be a good way to benchmark certain applications, but it may not contribute to the performance of how you run the other apps, and so it's an old benchmark. So um, moving on to the first application, GraphLab is a toolkit for graph, um, graph algorithms, which includes topic modeling, graph analytics, clustering, collaborative filtering, graphical models, and computer vision. So some practical applications of GraphLab is um, PageRank, which ranks websites in their search engine results. Um, image reconstruction, like um, the one image on the right, they introduce some white noise, as you can see at the bottom left, and then they applied some filters and tried to reconstruct the image, and they did a pretty good job. So um, it's also used for recommendation predictions, like Netflix, and also for image stitching, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, NEMO 5 stands for Nanoelectrics Modeling Tools, and it was developed by Purdue University. It was intended to be an all-purpose nanoelectric simulation tool. <coughs> it can simulate strain relaxation, phonon transport, and quantum transport and the modeling of quantum dots as well. So I'm not really sure what it is, but it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> so WARF stands for um, Weather Research and Forecasting Model, which was designed to serve both atmospheric research and operational forecasting needs. And yeah, that's a pretty cool visualization of some weather happenings here, <laughs> no idea. But yeah, in the competition, we were actually, we actually had to image and um, model a typhoon and it was pretty cool because we had to do it in 3D and like we could see all the high and low pressure regimes and different colors and it's pretty cool. I'm sorry I don't have any results to show you today because um, I wasn't the one who was running it. So yeah and this is hometown. 
So mystery avocation, it's um, called flying snakes. And how appropriate, because my greatest fear is snakes. So when I logged into, um, yeah, it was crazy. When I logged into the server and found out the mystery application, I saw that, oh, cool, we're dealing with snakes, which is great. But <laughs> um, yeah, so the um, background behind it is that there's this particular species of snake that actually, yeah, there we go, glides through the air and much research has been done to study the aerodynamics of an anatomically correct cross-section of a snake. So for this mystery application, I had to compile open foam. Well, actually, during my training, I compiled everything except open foam. So <laughs> yeah, it was great fun, you know, but yeah, it was good. I managed to compile it, and then I computed the data for four different angles of attack. So yeah, so the mystery application is mentioned before. You know, we don't know anything about it. We have no information whatsoever. We could probably guess what it's going to be about, but that's, you know, so what we, well, Rebecca actually designed a um, schedule for me, so I had to compile one new code every week and actually had to run it and run some data sets on it, so I'll be familiar with everything, so nothing would phase me, but, oh, I didn't have compile open for him. Um, so, yes, as you can see, when we get to the competition, there were there wasn't any rules made up, but it was just you know it was just a joke from SKCD. So what happened was we arrived in Denver on Thursday before the competition, and we we were hit with really bad jet lag. But it was <laughs> we, were, we were falling asleep at two o'clock local time, you know when we were, we were supposed to be awake. And so on the first day, we visited NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab to see the supercomputers, which is really, really cool. I've got some pictures to show you later on. Um, so there's this big hall and we had to set up everything. We, our machine got there before we did and we had to unpack it all and you know, um, just set it up, make sure it ran. And then um, on Monday evening, the competition kicked off and it's a 48 hour non-stop competition. So they also had a rule where you can't be on the floor for more than 12 hours, which kind of forces you to sleep. But you know, we, don't tell anyone, but we didn't really follow the rule. <laughs> so once the competition was over, we had a party or dinner at La Casa Bonita, which is pretty interesting if you've heard the um, South Park episodes. And then on Thursday, there was this um, professional versus amateurs competition in which all the professionals from um, HPC would actually compete with us. And we actually won, which was pretty surprising, even though the professionals could cheat because they apparently had um, a cluster or machinery that was not legally released yet and yeah <laughs> awesome right and they also had um, I think insight to what the application was so it wasn't a surprise to all of them the oh uh, no it was something else something totally different yeah so um, but then the rule was that us students as even though well you know um, We've got different groups. We can actually work together and collaborate all our resources, but we still cannot, you know, go above the power limit. But yeah, and then because we had better architecture than they did, even though they had the newer ones, we actually won. So that's great. Oh, they actually had um, an increased um, power allowance as well. So we're all complaining about it, but we won, so which is great. And then Friday, yeah, we flew back home Friday. So um, the top left is all of us at the um, NREL's, um, NREL's outside, outside NREL supercomputing facility. So we're actually standing in front of Perry Jean, which is the other supercomputer, and it's named after a bird, I believe. Yeah, and then um, going clockwise from there, we're actually setting up a cluster, and it's Todd in the black, um, helping, helping us to set it up. And then moving down from there, the pictures at the bottom are actually of those of the commodity track, which um, Rebecca mentioned before, and they had a, um, not, they had a money limit, that's right. So we had the power limit and they had a budget limit. So it was pretty cool because some of these people were really innovative. They actually stored their computers in those filing cabinets and actually cut out holes 
for their fans, so that's pretty innovative. And some people just have them on the table. Um, the image on the left is of the person, what was his name? Bill Grubb. Bill Grubb, yes. He was the chairman and kicked off our student competition with Happy Cheeks, of course. And then um, moving down to that picture, that's us and you know chatting away while Todd's working away <laughs> and we actually well, some of my teammates came up with this game called Super Pong where you actually had to beat the su supercomputer so they actually wrote a code in which it would be almost impossible to beat so you play against a computer and every time you gain a point by bouncing your ball off your paddle the computer would split their paddles into two and add more balls so it would be you know, really hard to beat it, but I did, and some of us did, which was great. It was good to attract the crowd and you know, to let them know what we're doing. And then on the top right, you, that's, um, what was that? Ah, yes, that was the, um, the results of the highest lean pack. You can't really see, but. Yeah, so our commodity. 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 So Arizona won the lowest dollars per flop of the pack, and they were the ones with the uh, with the drawers. Oh, yep. So, <laughs> yep. And yes, that's us with the um, SGI guys. That's Those two cats. Yes, so we, we represented Australia with passion. So everyone, you know, when, walk, when they walked past, they were like, oh, what are these? Like, oh, it's Tim Tans. Have you heard of them before? And they were like, oh, no, what are Tim Tans? Like, oh, it's a really awesome chocolate biscuit covered in chocolate. They were like, oh, I need to have one of these. And I'm like, yeah, go for it. We actually, um, oh, and we had like those little push out cardboard like animals which you could assemble. And it was a kangaroo standing over there in front of Jake, and a little frilled neck lizard. Yes, so. No, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, and then um, this is a picture taken outside La Casa Bonita. It's a really, really cool Mexican restaurant that has numerous levels and arcades, and it's crazy, it's good fun. And then when we were taking on the booth, we had a photo opportunity as well, and that's us with Happy Cheeks. We wanted to bring the sign back home, but we just couldn't fit it into any of the luggages. And yeah. No, and it's way too big for oversized luggage as well, so oh, we just left it there. So, yeah, we didn't do too bad. Um, the champion was University of Texas, which also won the year before, which is really good. It's really hard to maintain a winning standard. And, um, well, the other rankings weren't given, but we were in the middle of the pack, so that's not too bad for a first try, we think. And all of us learn so much. We, we always joke that um, our learning curve is actually exponential, where we actually learn the most in the first 24 hours of the competition because everything just started crashing. We, we didn't have any help from the coach at all because once the competition starts, the coach has to back off and it's just us and our knowledge. And yeah, it was, it was really tough, and, but it was really, really good fun. It's such good exposure. And yeah, and the coach plans to coach another team for 2014. There were eight teams in the sand track and four teams in the commodity track. And yeah, if you have any questions, you can visit these websites. And that's it from us. Yes. When you, you said you were using the Intel for part of the performance. Um, yep. Did you find any problems with make files on these? Or was the compatibility between them fine? Um, no, well, actually, it was pretty all right. Like, I think we just you know how to handle them, yeah? How many of your architectural choices actually mattered when it came to the competition and how many of them? So, you're right. can I have you repeat questions as well? Just after you okay, um, yeah, sorry. So how many of the architectural decisions that you made and the software stack decisions you made, how many of those were actually important and how many of them did you discover later really didn't matter? So how many architectural um, considerations actually mattered that contributed to our um, competition well well we designed our cluster so that we wouldn't win the lin pack but we would be able to perform well on the applications so 
Um, I think. How um, sorry, what? The file system choice, for example. How important was that? How important was the fastest? The file system. Oh, the file system. Oh, it was great. It was really, really good because um, our nodes, for some reason, just kept crashing. And our node one was our head node. And every time our node crashed, Ceph would just automatically, you know, okay, so they'll redirect all, um, all our data that was on that node and actually after a few minutes back it up again and so reboot the note on its own and yeah Ceph has come through for us so many times and, and you said you had half the time you'd run the GPUs for GPU intensive tasks and half the time you'd run the CPU or you'd run either the GPUs or the CPUs. Um, How important was that architectural decision? Well it was it was pretty important because like did I think the GPUs for anything except that? Uh, I think the boys did use the GPUs for Wharf. But other than that, it was silent because everyone just used um, CPUs because that's what we were accustomed to. When we were using IVEX resources, when we were training the entire year, we hardly used GPUs. We just mainly used CPUs. So, yeah. does that answer your question? Yes. What's a 10 times sign? Yeah, you know, what's a 10 times sign? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's when you bite like diagonal opposite ends of your Tim Tam and then you dip it and you sip up hot tea and so then you, you just put the entire the thing in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, and then it just melts and disintegrates, so it's just really cool. How did the team cope, I guess, personally with time and pressure? Um, how did the team cope with the time and pressure? Well, we, we tried as hard as we could to, you know, if we weren't tired, if we were deathly tired, <laughs> we would try to be at the stand and you know work as hard as we can. But we usually assign shifts, so and there was also a rule that there are no more than two people, uh, no less than two people at the stand during closing hours. So no two people, no no person had to be alone. So, but it was um, yeah, we we handled it fine. We will do it again, definitely. Yes. What's the most important thing you learned from the other competitors that you didn't know? What's the most important thing that I learned from the other competitors? Well, don't look to the left and right, just do what you do and be confident in you know, what you can do because that just pulls you through. Keep your head down and do what you yeah, do. Yeah, keep your head down, don't, well, don't listen to what other people might be saying. And yeah, also collaborate. Don't be afraid to ask because I had some heaps, I had heaps of trouble compiling open form because I haven't compiled it before. And so I actually went to the other teams and I'm like, can you help me, you know, is that, I, I don't mean to be, like, I can't steal your results, obviously, but, you know, can you please give me a few, tip, a few tips on how to pr progress and stuff, so. Do we have one more question? Yeah. How was Carl and Ethan as good as Carl makes that? Um, I think it's the company that makes it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yes, sorry, you had a question? Yeah. What level of documentation did you get from the mystery app and were you allowed internet access? Um, we weren't allowed, we were only allowed local internet access, so, and, but we couldn't actually, we couldn't access our um, computer from a remote server. So we couldn't be sitting back at our hotel rooms trying to crack codes. We actually had to be there and connected via the cable. And there were actually firewalls in like the, um, the committee were so actually. You like, access, but you couldn't get in. So you could use internet research. Yeah, you could, but you couldn't actually just like someone from Australia can actually log into your machine and <laughs> help you with it. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's alright. Cool. Uh, Rebecca Tom.